Thanks for watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. You can subscribe to our channel with the little button below. I think I'm pointing in the right direction and you will never miss an episode. Play that funky there music, is. producers. Funky music. You really just <laughs> I did. Hey everybody, it's Kai. Hey, I'm Molly Wood. This is Make Me Smart, the weekly podcast where Kai and I get smarter about all the things, well, the things that are tech, economy, and culture. We try to have a filter. And where you, the listener, <laughs> help us out because none of us is as smart as all we of us. I'm just saying, we try. Filter. That's right. <laughs> uh, so as you all know, one of the things we talk about a lot on this uh, podcast is personal data and privacy and how it's used, what we can do to get more of it, get control of it, take your pick. Uh, it's been plus or minus 25 years that we've been living in this uh, internet economy. And really, the point we're going to make today is that maybe what we've been in is phase one with computers and smartphones. Uh, and where we're heading now into phase two is going to be a whole different uh, kettle of fish. Yep. We're talking about uh, the technological trend colloquially known as the Internet of Things, which is the idea that everything is going to be connected to everything else. Watches, doorbells, toasters, smart homes, dog collars, water bottles, trash cans, plant feeders. Everything. I mean, everything, everything, yeah. everything. Other, and so I'm excited to say that this is like, <laughs> this is a Molly show. This is a Molly Bean show. That's, well, we're going to be living in it. So it's a Molly and Kai <laughs> and everybody on the planet show. Mm -hmm. uh, and, exactly. and I mean, here's the deal, right? There are estimates that the, the Internet of Things, as it's called, the market for the Internet of Things is going to be a $500 billion market by 2021, which is, oh, by the way, like like 11 months away. Um, there are going to be a trillion Internet of Things devices, everything from dog collars to, you know, plant feeders and whatever else Molly can think of um, in the next 15 years. And a big part of that business, of course, is the data that these devices get. So that's where we're going today. Bathroom mirrors, coffee cups. Ew. I could... <laughs> false fingernails i don't know and then not for nothing all of this really is largely dependent on the still nascent technology that we've also talked about in the show 5g so which is its own sort of other mm -hmm. giant business opportunity um so we're going to dig into all of this with tim cross he's the technology editor for the economist which recently devoted an entire issue of their tech quarterly to this very topic and i should note used data in the plural which we will discuss tim Thanks for coming on. Hi there. Thanks for having me. And you're joining us from London, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We really need to brag about how international our show is. Oh, how are things? Can we take a, a, a brief like Brexit jaunt and uh, ask you how, how things are there? How the, how you feeling? Uh, it, was, it was chaos before Brexit. And as far as I can tell, it's still chaos after Brexit. So, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. All right. Sounds about right. <laughs> Kai, do you want to jump in? Do you want to like start with a, a level set before I get into the extreme geekery? Because well, I will. Uh, oh my God, I, I didn't know we were going to get into extreme geekery. Um, but medium, but I guess medium geekery. Uh, so I, so look, I'm going to take up my usual uh, position on this program, which is skeptic and and naysayer. And just uh, on the theory that most people know what the Internet of Things is, right? It's all that stuff that Molly talked about and interconnectivity and all of that. Um, is this going to be a net positive or a net negative for the broader consuming public? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think one of the things that, that maybe makes the, the Internet of Things, which, by the way, needs a much better name, um, but one mm -hmm. of the things that makes it stand out from a lot of other consumer technologies is that it kind of starts with people in a bit of a position of skepticism, right? You know, this, this is... Um, people were very happy to get smartphones. People were very happy to get the internet back in the day. We weren't, weren't really thinking about the, you know, some of the downsides that we've now like, come to recognize. I think the IoT is maybe starting from a position of skepticism uh, you know, right in its early days, which I think is pretty unusual. What are, let's sort of talk about the enablers and the blockers, I guess, which is sure. the sort of easiest way to put this in a couple of different buckets. Where are we? And what do we need in order to sort of accomplish this this vision that, let's be honest, a lot of companies have laid out, which is the you know the the web of of devices working perfectly together and making everything better for us. So I think you can maybe break it down into sort of three or four uh, kind of big big uh, trends or big things you need to make this happen. And one is you need cheap computing. So if you look at uh, we know about Moore's law, which says you know the number of components you can cram into a piece of silicon doubles every couple of years and if you look at that the the price of computing has fallen 
it's hard to be too exact, but something like, you know, by, by a factor of about 100 million since the 1970s. So computing is, is incredibly cheap now. And, you know, kind of nice way to think about this is, you know, we used computers to send the Apollo astronauts to the moon half a century ago. And this cost, you know, billions of dollars and took up a huge proportion of America's government spending. And they're so cheap now that um, Pampers, the nappy company, uh, has announced this like computerized sensor that you can clip yeah. to like, little disposable nappies and it will tell you when your babies need changing because you know this is this is just how how insanely cheap it's got so that that's one thing um another thing is that you need some way for all these computers that you can put out into the world to kind of to, to know what's going on around them so you need sensors and again this is something that that uh, hasn't fallen quite that dramatically, but sensors are a lot cheaper than they were. They've been miniaturized, um, and in fact, smartphones have been have been one kind of big uh, big factor driving that. So you can attach things like cameras, or microphones, or you know position position sensors like GPS or accelerometers or whatever it is uh, to devices, and it's you know uh, like the compute. It's it's pretty cheap. Mm. Um, and then maybe you need some way to get all that data back. And this is where you mentioned 5G. This is where we need some kind of, you know, ubiquitous communications medium. And, you know, it turns out we can we can do that over the air with with uh, with cellular phone networks. Setting aside for just one brief nanosecond of sanity, the ridiculousness of having computer chips in diapers. Let me <laughs> let me ask um, this. This is not one of those markets that consumers in the very near future are going to be able to opt out of, right? Because it will become a de facto necessity of modern life. And as we talked about with, you know, the Y2K bug and all this jazz, it's not like you can go off the grid now. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, the... the companies would like you to buy these things because you, you like the features, right? So that they'd like to buy you... They would like you to buy a, a smart television or something like that. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's going to become very hard to opt out, partly because this stuff will be everywhere. So um, Amazon, for instance, they have these ring doorbells, uh, which are sort of very useful. They have yeah. little cameras in them. You can uh, you know, see who's, who's at your door, even if you're hundreds of miles away, all that kind of stuff. Um, individually, that's very useful. Collectively, they kind of add up to basically a sort of CCTV camera network of the sort that we have in London, in fact, famously. Um, and we've seen a lot of interest from police departments and getting hold of this this kind of footage, and you can kind of use them to to basically surveil your neighbourhood. So even if you don't have one yourself, it's going to be very hard for you to avoid turning up on somebody else's. Um, you know, you think about putting facial recognition into CCTV cameras. That's another you know great IoT uh, use case that we're seeing we're seeing everywhere. I mean, again, here the Metropolitan Police have just said they're they're going to roll this stuff out across the city. Um, I know there's been arguments about it in the states. I think San Francisco's banned. Uh, the city government from from using it, but you know once it's out there, unless you're going to go around everywhere in a, in a ski mask, it's kind of hard to <laughs> it's kind of hard to avoid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have to say, I read a lot of sci-fi in which ski masks or even like super high tech face distortion technology is just an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's also a, a sort of more insidious way that it's going to become hard to opt out. And that is if you look at the kind of commercial imperatives behind this. So mm -hmm. if you go out now and try and buy a, a television, um, let's say you don't want a smart TV because you're worried that it's going to get hacked or you don't want you don't like the idea of your, you know, your TV seller uh, collecting data on your viewing habits or whatever, you're going to find that's quite hard to do. And, you, you know, you're going to have to buy a, a TV with the sort of smart bits in it. You don't necessarily have to connect it to the Internet. Um, but the reason for that is it, it the smart TVs are better for the companies as well because they can sell the viewing data that they collect from people using them. And then they can use that to subsidize the purchase price of the TVs. Or if you look at insurance, like a, a lot of car insurers are experimenting now with like streaming data from your uh, str straight from your car, because cars these days come with you know SIM cards and and phone network connections, and uh, you know that's great for them because it's it's makes it much easier for them to see like well who's a safe driver who you know who takes risks who lives in a dodgy who drives in a in a sort of unsafe part of town versus who doesn't, and so you know for the companies there's a there's a pretty strong incentive to kind of push this stuff as hard as they can. Um, I want to return to data, which is its own kind of sub theme, but. Let's, but you mentioned hacking, and I think that's an important thing to bring up because it, it does feel like this is a technology that we're really plowing ahead with, and cybersecurity experts are tearing their hair out about how security is not being built in from the ground up, right? 
Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, we've we, we've seen this movie before because that's how we built the original internet. You know, it was an academic mm-hmm. research network. We just kept connecting computers to it because it seemed like a good thing to do and no one was really thinking about security. And, and we can kind of see the consequences of that, you know, 20, 30 years later. And as we're just sort of mostly repeating that process with, with the Internet of Things. So, uh, you know, the people who are selling these smart toothbrushes or, or whatever it is, you know, I think part of the problem is that, that a lot of these companies are not, uh, not sort of computing companies, at least not historically. So they aren't kind of in, you know, thinking about cybersecurity requires a, a kind of certain slightly paranoid mindset that maybe, you know, maybe you would find at Microsoft or Apple or <laughs> Google or someone like that, but you wouldn't necessarily find it, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't want to name names, but, you know, a toothbrush maker or a fridge company or, 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 or something like that. Um, and I think also that, it, again, it's not clear that there's, you know, I would say this working at The Economist, but it, it's not clear that there are, there are sort of good incentives for these people to take it seriously. Because if you think about what security is, you know, it's not really top of the list when you're, when you're sort of buying a, a product. Um, and it's very hard to see the benefits. So if you buy a secure device, you know, the best thing you want is for nothing to ever happen to your device, right? Yeah. You want it to be really boring and never to have any kind of hack attempts. So... So when you're the guy at the company trying to justify all this spending that you're 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 putting into securing your products, you're saying, "Well, hey, look, boss, nothing's happened." <laughs> and you know, that's just that's kind of quite a hard argument, I think, to be making year after year after year at at at, at sort of boardroom level. So I think you know all of the incentives kind of here are, are, are pointing in the wrong direction, and we've already seen like some of the damage that that this can do. We've had you know IoT flavored you know, big cybersecurity uh, problems and big hacks already. What do you imagine the regulatory framework looks like? Because, you know, we can't figure out regular Internet, let alone Internet of everything. I, th- I think that's a very good point. Um, and it's a really hard question. I mean, if, if there are some, so some governments around the world, so here in the UK and I think also in California, there's, there's talk of um, regulations that kind of establish really sort of low baselines and try to stop people doing anything too to, you know, and try to stop people doing anything that's that's really dumb. So uh, they talk about things like preventing you from selling a product where, you know, you can't change the default password, say, or the products you say you sell have to have some way to get software updates into them so that if someone finds a big problem with it, at least we can try and fix it. Um, there's talk about making companies promise in advance, you know, how long are you going to support this product for with those software updates? Because, you know, this is another another kind of place where the, the, the cultures of computing and, and, and like the rest of the economy don't necessarily mesh. Because, you know, if I if I buy a smartphone, a lot of the time I only get updates for, you know, two, three, four years. If I buy something like mm. a car, that could right. still be on the road in, in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time, you know. And w- it's not even clear to me that we know how to support a computer product for like two or three decades. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, by the time it's at the end of its life, all the guys who worked on the original software will have left the company. There'll be very little in the way of, of sort of institutional memory. So I think it's a really naughty problem, actually. Hmm. Well, and then uh, to get even more naughty, let's talk about data. Yeah. Because it, I mean, the, the data implications, the data is necessary or are necessary um, for the kinds of efficiencies, business efficiencies that companies are promising by connecting all these devices, right? Like the positive spin here is not just more advertising or more surveillance. It's listen, if things are connected, we can know when they're going to break. We can, you know, understand traffic flows in a way that helps us design cities better. We can insert benefit here. But the flow of data is only going to grow exponentially. And is that also an area where it feels like, you know, we're starting from zero? I, I think in, in some ways it is. I think I think um, we have good ways of, of sort of analyzing this stuff and, and using it for businesses. I think maybe where we're sort of running to catch up a bit is 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 on the regulation. Um, I mean, for instance, one of the one of the sort of unambiguously good use cases, I think, is if you look at medical implants. So if I've got a pacemaker, uh, I you know, you can now get pacemakers that have wireless connections and they can stream data about what your heart's doing kind of constantly to 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 some uh, remote computer that can that can monitor it all. And if, if the computer sees something weird or something, you know, that, that that looks bad, they can identify your doctor, they can identify you. You, you know, you, you have m- way more sort of insight into what's going on, you know, 
in in your own body with this stuff. And I think that's that's good. Um, but there's there's a sort of awkward question about um, who has access to this stuff. So I think certainly some of the early generations of devices, you know, they were they weren't designed for patients as such. You know, the patients were just the people who were you know having their bodies cut open and these things implanted into them. Um, the real customers, as it were, were doctors or insurance companies yeah. or, or or hospital groups. And so you have patients who've said, well, you know, I've got this this computer that's that's controlling my heart basically. And I have no insight into what it's doing. I can't see what data it's it's sort of throwing off. I have to sort of go go begging to my doctor if I if I want to see this. And even then, they might say no. Um, so I think all of these questions around, you know, what is personal data? What rights should you have over it? Um, you know, what happens when it gets kind of mixed up with 50 million people's other personal data? You know, what happens to your rights then? I think again, we're we're you know, you've seen some places, uh, the European Union, again, I think California, you know, trying to grapple with this stuff, but it's 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 very sort of early days. And I think we're really just kind of trying to stake out what the problems might be at this point. And, and we should be clear here, there is a lot of good that is going to come from this thing. It's not all, you know, doom and gloom. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think, you know, we we mentioned the example of, of health care. Um, you can talk about particularly... Um, if you move away from the consumer side and you look at some of the uses in in, in things like industry, uh, you know, so I went to see uh, Rolls Royce, which is a big um, mm-hmm. manufacturer of jet engines. Among others, I'm talking about the jet engines, not the the luxury cars. Um, and they uh, they've been using this technology for sort of 20 years because it, it makes sense there because the engines they sell are so expensive. And you can do things like you can you can watch your engine wear out pretty much in real time <laughs> as it's you know bolted to the wing of a plane and flying around the world. And if something goes wrong with it, or if you think, oh, okay, you know, this or that part is going to need replacing, you can arrange to have it waiting at the hmm. at a you know at the destination airport for a particular flight, uh, and that saves you know hours or maybe even days of of sort of maintenance time. And you kind of you know if you can imagine repeating those kind of small nice to have gains across you know increasingly more and more of the economy, it adds up into something into something pretty powerful, I think. How far away are we from, you know, from this sort of like comprehensive vision? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think it, like all of these things, it'll be it'll be sort of a slow burn. There won't be, you know, there won't be a year we can point to and say this is the year when, when the Internet of Things arrived. And I mean, um, William Gibson, you know, he has this wonderful phrase about how the future is already here. It's just not widely distributed. Uh, and I think that's that's exactly the case with with the IoT. I mean, w- we mentioned the smart pacemakers. You know, that's not theoretical. There are people walking around with these things right now. Uh, your car already almost certainly has a SIM card buried in it somewhere. Uh, you know, we've seen smart speakers are, are sort of taking off. CCTV is sort of facial recognition is sort of spreading slowly through cities. Uh, so I think, you know, if there is an inflection point, we'll probably only be able to spot it uh, in the rear view mirror, as it were. But I think this is something that's that's sort of happening now uh, and is just going to get more and more visible and probably accelerate in the next, you know, four, five, six years. Tim Cross is technology editor for The Economist, and The Economist has just published a big quarterly report on the Internet of Things. We're still looking for that better name. Tim, <laughs> thanks a lot for coming on. <laughs> I'm with you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Tim, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> internet of stuff? Internet. I don't know. What do you, what do you call internet it? Internet phase two? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, we already had internet <laughs> 2.0, right? That was that was like five years ago or whatever the hell it was. I, just dis- I actually just interviewed someone, Peter Diamandis, mm-hmm. who it was like the founder of X-Prize, the X-Prize you know, in yeah. Singular. Yep. Um, and he, in his new book, he talks about the sort of coming age of connectivity as like a skin that's going to be laid over the planet, like this pulsing skin what and it'll have you? capillaries. And yeah, it was sort of like simultaneously awesome and gross. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you say that about something technological, I know it's a little icky, right? I mean, the skin metaphor just went on and on. I was like, okay, I got, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Next. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but yeah, tell us what you think. Do you want all the things to be connected? Can you see the benefit? Do you think the skepticism is going to sort of... Yeah kill it, you know, dead before it gets started? Um, or are companies just going to do what they do? Yes, they will. And That's the answer. move on ahead That's without the us. That's the answer. <laughs> I mean, there. you could also email us and tell us what you think. Make me smart at marketplace.org. <laughs> You'll probably think the same thing. 
I like that you had a rare moment. Optimism. Of like, but some Optimism. things are good, right? It's and then you're like, no. terrible. They're still going to do it whether it's terrible or not. Well, they are. I mean, come on. Uh, you're, you're so right. Okay, we'll be right back. Boom. Back. We're back. Back at your back. back. Boom. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I notice here huh? in our shared Google Doc rundown, you have changed your item. So hit me up. I did. Yes. I, yeah. My first item was going to make me cry and I just couldn't talk about it. So oh. I'm going to like, I'm going to move on. Um, I, and also, so it's very, yeah. you know, for the last, now we're on like week three of obsessing about coronavirus a little bit. And I was starting to, after week two, after last week, I was starting to think like, maybe I should chill. And I got, you know, I saw some tweets that sort of said, like one doctor was saying, if there's any virus you're going to get this year, like you should pray that it's coronavirus because it seems kind of mild and, you know, and everybody's like overblowing the state of the pandemic. Now in week three, I think we can all agree that is not true. Um, and that even if we are, it's a huge deal. Yeah. And it's becoming a huge economic story, which I think is also what you're going to talk about. Uh, and just one. <laughs> no cheating. No like tiny, tiny. I, click, mm. I just I like to be prepared. All right. But one tiny, not tiny at all. One manifestation of that is that at least one Apple analyst has lowered his iPhone shipment forecast by 10 percent. 10 percent, meaning 36 to 40 million units in the first quarter of this year because the coronavirus outbreak is affecting iPhone supply in China so much. Right. Tim Cook actually addressed it in the company's quarterly earnings, but I think that was even before coronavirus had been declared, I think officially like a global pandemic and Right. Um right. yeah. Anyway, it's it's a big deal. It, it is a big deal. And so continuing with a the theme here, my uh, item was a tweet from um Greg Ipp, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, a a very skilled observer of um a lot of things macroeconomic. And what he said, I guess this past weekend, frankly, I can't remember exactly when it was. Um, he said, if anyone was wondering what a decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies looks like, we're kind of getting a natural experiment, which is actually true, because a lot of what's going on in China has uh, basically sealed that country off from big chunks of the rest of the world, right? Airlines aren't flying. Hong Kong is shut off. Cities are quarantined. All of that deal. And to Molly's point about iPhone shipments, here's the deal. So it's uh, American and United and somebody else, I think, among the big legacy carriers in the United States, have canceled flights to and from China through like April or something. I mean, it's a long time. And yeah. here's the deal. When those planes fly, yes, people on the passenger deck, but down in the cargo hold, there's stuff. There's cargo and shipments and goods and all of that stuff, some of which probably are iPhones. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, and those planes ain't flying. How are those phones getting to where people need them to be? It's a, it's exactly. becoming a big deal. I've been saying for the last couple of weeks on Marketplace on Fridays, we, we do our weekly wrap, and I've been asking people whether they think the coronavirus is the black swan that could perhaps end the expansion that we've been seeing in this country for the last 11 and a half or something years. Um, yep. I, I think it's a worthwhile question to be asking. I think so, too. And I have heard some of your guests say, oh, I don't think so. Yeah. I think, but you have seen... You know, I think you're seeing the global stock market sort of stop start, like a little bit of a stutter response to it. Like, well, no, this is really bad. And then, oh, but now it's a big sale at the stock store. And, you know, then you see a rebound. And <laughs> yes, it's a big sale at the stock store. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is what I often think every time the stock market goes well, down. It, but it's... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I think there, I think there is a real question. Global supply chains being what they are, right? Yeah. Like this has been the conversation about the trade war this whole time, which right. is how do you tease apart these supply chains? Because right, it's not just iPhones in the cargo hold of those planes, it might be semiconductors. Right, and then right, for sure, right, exactly. But but look, to that global sale at the uh, at, at the stock store thing, um, <laughs> If so we're recording this on Monday, we're going a day early because who's traveling? I'm traveling uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, and if you look at the markets today, China got whacked overnight, right? First day open since uh, this thing became a really big deal, down, down the limit on the Shanghai exchanges, like 9% or something. And you look at the American markets, 
right? And the American markets mm-hmm. are keying off an indicator that came out this morning from the um, Institute of Supply Management that says, you know what, American manufacturing had a bounce back in our most previous in our in our most recent numbers, and American stocks and the algorithms that trade them are saying, yay, America's fine, bye, bye, bye. Right. And so as right. I sit here, the Nasdaq is up, you know, one point three percent. The broader S and P is up uh, eight tenths. I mean, you know, there's yeah. there's something weird happening. Well, I'm pretty sure that the real it, it's possible that you've been right all along. And the real decoupling is the stock market from anything even remotely oh, well, yeah, resembling that's, the economy well, at this sure. point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's not even you know. it is bananas. Yeah. But, you know, if your 401k is there yeah. or you have like a teeny bit of money, like wait yep. for those sales at the stock store. Yeah, exactly. Because that's <sighs> might as well be opportunist about it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So those are our thoughts. Uh, podcast edition. But since this is going to be a pretty big week news wise, right, we've got the State of the Union. We've got Iowa. Kinda. We've got the Senate uh, verdict coming on Wednesday. Big deal. Uh, more explainers with extra content on the primaries in the State of the Union. All that stuff. Just tell that Echo device sitting on your kitchen counter or on your dresser in the bedroom. Um, just say, make me smart. And, um, and it will start talking to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say she, stories. but that would be weird. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Okay. All right. I read this great, speaking of like future sci-fi dystopians, yeah. uh, a sort of like throwaway <laughs> aspect of a sci-fi book that I read recently included the idea that if you anthropomorphize your device, like oh, you call yeah. it she sure. and you think it's your buddy, sure. that in the future, those devices will know that about you as a data point and use it to manipulate you to buy more things. Great. You don't want to make me feel bad by not shopping, great. Kai. Great. That's great. Right? Lovely. So smart. It was so clever. Fabulous. All right. Let's <laughs> Let's do the mailbag. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. <laughs> I mean, that's a good thing. You're, you're, you have yes. carved off your heart yes. from your... Your echo. Uh, last week, we interviewed Francis Moore LePay about sustainable food production and the plant based diet. We also recently did a show about meat replacement. We have gotten lots of comments from people saying, you know, hey, plant based isn't the only solution. Sometimes meat is sustainable too. We've actually gotten a lot of feedback on both of these shows, which is great. I, I just think it's super interesting and I love that it's like resonating so much, um, I, which I guess makes sense because, you know, food pretty much <laughs> necessity for everybody. Yes. Um, But people are pointing out to us that regenerative agriculture is super complex and that the plant-based diet doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. We got a letter from one farmer who pointed out that regenerative agriculture is in fact also difficult to do. Mike Haas, Haas, an organic farmer in the Heartland writes, always appreciate what FML has to say, Francis Morlepay, not F my life. (laughs) And he says, it just really confused me for a second. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, anyway, always appreciate what FML has to say and a moment where Kai is extremely optimistic. Yeah. What? But I kept waiting for Kai to ask for the data on regenerative mm. ag. The reason sustainable ag is being rebranded, I think, is because it's really hard and takes time and work to get good results. People are making crazy claims under the regener- <clears throat> regenerative ag moniker, but where's the data? He goes on to say, who's going to pay me the price difference when I put half my crop acres in trees? I'm okay with vegans, veggies, omnivores, etc. I just want people to know that somewhere very near them is a farm with sustainable meat raised on good old carbon trapping grass, not lab manufactured. No need to eat a ton of protein, but you don't have to close the door either. Plus, all that meal packaging just undid the sustainable egg benefits you wanted in the first place. And then he signs off. Sorry, no recorder. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I love the shift yeah. to email opening that's up right. all the commentary. That's right. No, I think that's really good. Michael Pollan, right? Eat food, not too much, mostly yeah. plants. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, look, it, it's, it's re- first of all, being a farmer in, in ag is r- incredibly difficult. And if you try to do things in a more sustainable way, it gets more difficult, right? I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's the name of the game. Uh, Okay, a couple of weeks ago, we played a voice memo from a woman who had no plans to have a baby, but all of a sudden started getting tons of promotions in the mail for baby products, and she was kind of creeped out about it. And we talked about how marketers can identify your age and things like that. But listener Jonathan Garris wrote in to tell us that there's actually a bit more to it than that. And because we got only emails and no voice memos this week, I am going to read this for you. And he says... 
When marketers detect a milestone in a customer's life, they are able to quantify the residual income that will come from hooking that customer. For certain events, the downstream impact will be much higher than others. So if you order a new pair of ice skates online, you might be added to a list of people with a new hobby for ice skating. Looking at that group, companies may calculate your worth an incremental $50 annually for the next three years because on average you'll buy skate guards, two laces, and maybe a costume. Hmm. Sorry. A costume? A costume? Question mark. Amazing. Close, close, close parentheses. <laughs> Anyway, so specific. anyway, <laughs> c- continuing on, Jonathan says, but if a company can identify a first time expectant mother, then they have found an oil gusher because anybody whose mm. parents here knows this. That was me, not Jonathan. Uh, there will be thousands of dollars in annual spend for the next 18 years with known seasonal results. Not only will they know you need weekly orders of diapers and new baby furniture, but they can extrapolate future purchases, i.e. at the beginning of eighth grade, the child will need a $100 scientific calculator. So different wow. events are more significant in the numbers game. If you buy a new house or have a baby, you are much more interesting to marketers than if you buy a book or a swimsuit. That is such a great point yeah, and so really fascinating. And it it also explains why it is in the interest of marketers to really kind of like blanket you with mm-hmm. targeted advertising yeah. around like, are you having a baby? It's sort of like the spam technique because even if only one in a hundred of, them, right, of right, those women exactly are actually it. having a baby, it's totally worth it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Fantastic. You guys are so smart. Yep. Um, I want to do like just a little sort of a wrap up because I've gotten several tweets Uh, And a couple of emails from people complaining, actually, about that documentary Game Changers that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Nutritionists and trainers have written to me disputing the premise that plant-based diets will help you get swole, (laughs) i.e. are a good way to build muscle. Um, In fact, several of them were like, please stop talking about it. I spent all my time telling people that this is not true. So I do want to clarify one thing, which is like, I just heard that the Game Changers thing is fascinating. It's making people go vegan. It's not necessarily a recommendation. I haven't seen it. However, you don't trust Arnold? Schwarzenegger? Captain Muscle Builder? I don't so, know. So now you're going to get a bunch of Arnold used steroids back in the day tweets, Molly. Oh, I totally am. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair point. You aren't yeah. supposed to get bigger as you age. That's true. That correct. That's a really good point. That um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and watch it yeah. and decide. But I do want to note that, that, that I have gotten that feedback from yeah. people Con- being like, God help consult us. Your, consult your own nutritionist and personal fitness expert. Just you know, Exactly. Just yeah. Uh, We will end on our Make Me Smart question. This one is a little bit cynical, or in the words of our producer, Sam Anderson, Rizdalian. Oh, please. (laughs) And it comes, you're getting a reputation. It comes from listener Katie Brown. My name is Katie. I'm a PhD student studying climate policy, and as my side hustle, I work for a think tank that reports on the UN climate negotiations. Something that I thought I knew, but I later found out I was wrong about, is that the global diplomatic effort to address climate change is about the climate. It's not. It's about economics. When I first attended the UN climate negotiations as a wide-eyed student, I expected to witness these really technical discussions about how we measure emissions or perhaps how we evaluate risk. Instead, over time, I've realized that at their core, all of these negotiations are about money. The current global agreement, which is also known as the Paris Agreement, is built on the trust that if one major economy, say the United States, foregoes economic growth in order to prevent severe climate change, another major economy, say hypothetically China, will also forego growth. Similarly, countries in the developing world trust that the opportunities they forego to continue developing and improving the lives of their people will be balanced out by financial support from wealthy countries. It's a really complicated and delicate dynamic. And yes, it's about climate and uncertainty and risk. But at the end of the day, it's mostly about money. Yeah. So look, number one, yes, that's true. Number two, I I guess I would just quibble with one little word in there, and that is forego economic growth. I think maybe a better Mm -hmm. and more constructive way to think about it is to think of it as not foregoing economic growth, but refocusing where your growth is going to come from, right? Because there are billions and trillions to be made in climate-friendly um, businesses, industries, sectors, and companies um, mm-hmm. that, you know, some of which we haven't even thought of yet. And they will grow because this area is going to grow. Uh, it's, just mm-hmm. a question of, it's just a question of when and how fast. So you're not foregoing growth so much as you are redirecting where your growth comes from. That is that is my two cents. Right. I, w- I could see that in our kind of a uh, short-term mindset, which is, mm-hmm. yep. you know, how governments and companies well, and operate. politicians, right, for sure, yeah. And politicians, exactly. Yeah. They're thinking, I can't 
that it's there's no there needs to be like the concept of a growth a rebuilding year you know like you have a sports franchise and they lose all their stars or mm -hmm. everybody on the warriors gets hurt and then you have to like invest in rebuilding with the knowledge that you will win again in the future yeah, I, I guess I, would, I guess I would say that really what you want to do is think of it not as a rebuilding year, right? Because that kind of insinuates that you're you're taking a pause and you're actually just sitting right. back and waiting for stuff to happen. I think the catch, of course, is that you have to go on two tracks. You have to develop on both tracks, right? The the place where all the money is now, right, which is oil and and dirty carbon and all of that jazz, right? Changing, but too slowly. Uh, and but you also have to invest in uh, the place where the money's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's that's the absolutely challenge. anyway. Yep. There you go. There you go. Uh, and that's it. On that, uh, like that was see, that was like an inspiring note. You were like, "Go do Get it." Load of me. Who am I, know, I and what have I done with Kai Rizdo? Super confusing, but delightful. <laughs> Happy Monday, everyone. That's it for this. On that note, we're just going to stop here. We're out. You should definitely, however, you can get much more uh, in information and news inspiring and otherwise in our newsletter, marketplace.org slash newsletters. I say that only because the news can be a little upsetting lately. Um, but I know that our great newsletter team works hard to find you interesting tidbits that will hopefully not just like bum you out. Yes. Totally yeah. true. Subscribe totally true. today. Marketplace.org slash newsletters is where you go. Is the, is the, news, is, is the newsletter team anybody besides Erica? I think it might just mostly be I, Erica. I, I mean, so. I, th I think there's probably some producers and stuff. I don't want to, like, you know, right. leave everybody right. out. But but right. Erica is the one who, like, makes yes. it all happen. All right. She's going to get another shout-out as soon as the music starts. I don't, it's never going to start. We should just go. Okay. Just go. Okay, well, bye. Uh, bye. I hit stop on all the... Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I'm uploading my video now. And, oh, right. Make Me Smart is produced oh, and directed by Sam Anderson, who wants to storm out of the room right now. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producers, Ben Hathcote, and our video intern, Ethan Peretz. And thank you to writer-producer Erica Phillips. Is Ben even here? She's so I good. Ethan did all the work today. I don't even think Ben's here. Good right. job, Ethan. Good go, man. Intern bringing it home. This week's I program know. was engineered by Drew Jostat. The theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Tatar Nieves. The senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. Boom. There we go. Speaking of video, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you now that when you said Y2K, I wrote it down on a piece of paper and held it up to the camera and made a what now oh, wow. face? Right? I mean yeah. Y2K. Yeah. Going back in time. Way back. I mean, how is it possible that that's way back too? Anyway? Well, because we're we're both because like a lot that's of why. people are like like weren't born. Yeah. I mean, yeah.